is it like fiction mostly fiction werewolf stories or like real life I'm kidding. what do you mean what do you mean mostly fiction what is the non-fiction werewolf story <laughs> Huffing and puffing, sort of style. There's another energy to power the right. Let's achieve your goals to joy, not stress. It's a men green ukulele podcast. <laughs> Welcome to the men green ukulele podcast, where we talk about achieving through joy and not stress. Today, we're talking about stories. You know, we hear a lot about whether it's in branding or in presentation, tell more stories. Um, actually, stories can be very fun to tell. It can be very engaging. And we have, you know, a story expert, story superstar, story whisperer, Francisco Mafus with us today. So without further ado, let's get into Juicy Stories and Meaty Ketchup. Juicy Stories and Meaty Ketchup. Meaty, meaty, meaty Ketchup. I am with... Francisco Mafuz, hello, welcome. Hello, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, welcome to the Mint Green Ukulele podcast. You're a keynote speaker and storyteller coach. Uh huh. You're the author of <clears throat> Bear, a guide to brutally honest public speaking, and the host of Story Powers podcast. Check that podcast out. Podcast out. It's awesome. And you've been telling stories in front of audiences for close to a decade, and you even became a national champion of public speaking. Right. Indeed. So you know what you're talking about, and uh, well, well, <laughs> I, mean, I I don't know if I know context. what I'm talking about. I talk about lots of stuff. If I actually know about it, that it, it that depends. <laughs> what is a national champion of public speaking? Okay, so <laughs> so some people to some people this is easy to explain. To some people, not so much, because there is this organization that has been out there for. 70 or 80 years and they're called toastmasters yeah and so yeah so so they're all over the world and these are clubs where people meet every week or every other week to to do some amount of public speaking and there's speeches there's improvisational stuff um there's a lot of feedback and it's a whole bunch of weird people that clap for everything and they're super positive and everybody seems nice um it's it's kind of a cosmos uh, a cosmos a mini a mini cosmos of the world that does not exist actually and it's really creepy the first time you go but i i joined uh, i joined a long time ago and I started doing some speeches and it turned out that I, I didn't completely suck at them. And Toastmasters, they have competitions. So they have yeah. competitions for the improvised stuff. They have competitions for humorous stuff, for non-humorous stuff. And uh, there was a, over a year or two, I, I got into the competition scene and, and competed in a few things. And I ended up the, 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 at the national level, I won both the improvised speech and the humorous speech. And I got second place on the non-humorous one and on feedback so so that was that that was my claim to fame on the national speaking thing wow wow that is really awesome when it comes to <laughs> improvising a speech like what would be the step that you would have in mind to do that yeah so the first one of the first steps that i took when it came to to the competition was i cheated uh, which was, you know, quotes are something that make you sound remarkably more intelligent because uh, it's not something you said, it's something someone else said. Yeah. So I remember going into the competition because there's lots of levels, right? So yeah. I always had three or four quotes that had broad application in my mind. Mm. And, and I went in and somebody gave me something I could use. It's like, okay, well, I, I have that Einstein quote that might sound sensible here. So I just found a way to drop that, which has always made you seem a lot more cool, cooler on your feet than, than someone who's just kind of you know, free flowing and improvising. But the main thing is, you you need to decide so the way they do it is they give you a topic usually mm -hmm. or ask your question you've got 30 seconds to think and then you have up to three minutes you have to talk for between one minute and a half to three minutes and for me it was always okay what is the point that i'm going to try to make mm -hmm. and do i have any personal story that or a quote that makes that you know buff buffs up that point and then i usually started with the quote or the personal story. And then I made sure to circle back to that point with a summary of what I had just described. And then it just felt like a mini speech. 
you know, this is my opinion on why the education system is broken. And then I had the Einstein quote about education. I share a couple of personal things about education. And then I circle back to whatever point I'm trying to make. Mm. If you manage to do that in three minutes and people know that you've basically just improvised this thing, it makes it sound really coherent and, and competent where if you're just kind of going on on tangents it's like oh you know yeah i think it is not good um mm. because that just doesn't really work it doesn't yeah. come across as well yeah also because you're talking about something that you know when you're just telling a story you're not making it up i'm guessing that it also brings a lot more confidence to just like you know explaining a point that you're trying to put across yeah, it's always, I, I always explain that a story in, in the context of business, at least, is is a real life example that mm -hmm. makes a point. Yeah. And I always find that if, you, if you're going to explain something and you have an example, use the example first instead of theories or opinions, because the example is not usually, I mean, if you've chose the right example, it's not really debatable. You know, people are not going to go, well, I'm not sure that's right. It's like, well, yeah. it's something that happened to me. Okay, you know, unless, <laughs> I'm, unless I'm really forcing, shoehorning the example into some subject, it, you're not gonna. You can go, oh, interesting. That's not my experience with that. Mm -hmm. But you're not, unless you think I'm a liar, you're not gonna question what I just said. But if I give a statistic, you can question my sources. You can say I've seen a different statistic. Maybe you're wrong. So you said the right examples. I saw. I, I know you talk also about finding. The stories that work and that don't work in your branding or in in when you you do a presentation what is the story that works and that doesn't work most people have met you know either they are or they know someone who is what i call a story weirdo <laughs> so this might be a work a, a, you know a, a workmate uh, might be a, a relative it might be a friend might be a partner and it's the person that there's many things that they do but one of them is saying stuff like i have a great story for you and it's very rarely great or oh i have a really funny story to tell you and it's not funny at all and then when they start telling it they they make a voice it's like, so we were there in Prague. Um, they overact stuff. Yeah. And they go on and on and on and on and never seem to get anywhere. And you're like, you like this has been going on for like seven minutes now. I have no idea where this thing is going. Okay? And those are the people that, that, that give storytelling a really bad name. Mm. Doing any of those things is terrible. Like you don't announce stories because people have a, a certain resistance to the idea of a story. They think this is for children this is fiction this is not or it's just going to be boring yeah um, uh, so you don't announce stories mm. you don't do voices you don't overact you don't go on for ages you don't talk for any period of time really without giving some idea of what your point is going to be and those are some examples of stories that don't work um the other thing is just having a story that is suited both in topic and length and subject to where you are and what you're trying to do mm. because i can i have really funny bathroom stories i'm not really sure i should be telling them at a corporate meeting you know maybe maybe not at the first story i tell maybe the 10th story can be can be something a little more you know under the line um but but not the first one maybe maybe never uh it shouldn't be a like i have stories that could go on for 20 minutes they're yeah. very rarely going to be suited for anything anyone other than my friends mm. and even even with my friends I'm, I'm pushing that very hard um you can you can tell you can tell a story that is just a great story, really well told. It's only a couple of minutes long, makes a great business point, but is not the problem you're talking to people about. Mm. You, know, you can have a great story about teamwork, but you're talking to people about something completely different. Then it's just not a story that's going to work. They might hear and go, well, it's a great story. No idea why you told it. <laughs> no, like, did, anyone, yeah. did anyone, anyone get this? Yeah. Not oh, really, great story and then they go what is this thing with storytelling people think they should tell a story but what's the point of this yeah because there was a it was the wrong story might have been a good story but at the wrong time so none of those things are are stories that work mm -hmm. a, st a story that works needs to be needs to have a very clear point that yeah. is connected to the thing you're talking about it needs to have the right length which is usually short 
you know, anything between, you know, a minute to three minutes is pretty much the limit for the vast majority of stories. Um, and you need to tell it well enough that people are engaged and not bored out of their minds while listening to you. And then, you know, surprisingly, you can bore someone out of their minds in a minute um, if you if you don't don't know what you're doing. So so that those are just some of the things that make a story work or not work. Yeah, and it's funny because you said like <laughs> you said not making a voice, like don't make a voice, don't announce it, don't send it, don't in announce face. it. Yeah, and a face. Um, and I think that that's often maybe what people will go to in order to make a story interesting. You said you can bore something out of their mind in one minute. Like, what are some elements that make a story, like, make a good story, the right story, but told it right also? So one of the, the main thing, like, people have heard this before, you know, show, show don't tell. But, but a lot of people don't understand what that means. And usually what it means when it comes to storytelling is that you want to give me enough information that I can have a little movie in my mind. Okay. Yeah. So if I tell you, if I tell you, um, it's, it's a summer night, I'm 16 years old and I'm in the roof of my father's house with a couple of friends. Okay. Now you have a very clear idea. I mean, your idea of a roof might be different than the reality, but it doesn't matter. You can picture, okay, a roof of someone's house. He's 16. I can he's maybe a little different and he's got a couple of friends. So now there's a little movie you're envisioning. You can say, you know, I walked into the meeting room. My boss was sitting there and all my workmates were there uh, and they were just looking at me. Okay. So now you can, now I'm literally engaging more parts of your brain because all the you know the visual cortex is going on. There's maybe maybe the, you you imagining the sound of what's going on in the room. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on, and your brain is now more engaged. If I don't give you those visual or the sensory cues, then it's harder for you to to literally to picture what's going on, and mm -hmm. that makes the story less engaging. So that's one thing. The other is when stuff happens instead of giving me the action or ideally the dialogue you just tell me it happened so so i'm talking to my boss and we're discussing we're discussing the project that just finished so this is you telling me mm. what if you say so 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 my boss says so francisco what the hell happened to that that project like that was a catastrophe and i'm like uh well yeah i know it wasn't that is very different. Like it's it's much more vivid when it's dialogue. Mm. So, so that's another thing that helps. That helps a lot. And the and, and finally, like you have to get to some sort of problem or conflict quickly enough because if you keep giving me context, like you know, so I'm in I'm in the meeting room. My boss is there. All my colleagues are there. You know, and we just finished a big project, and the project didn't go as well. That's boring. Yeah where you can just go into the conversation where the boss is saying what happened to that project like that was really important and like there was a disaster you now know that i just finished a project that was important to the company and didn't go well yeah and you did that in two sentences in a much more entertaining way than giving me context it's like let me just set the scene it's like you don't need to do that you can just go into the conversation or go into the action um so that yeah some basic things that make stories more interesting. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious to how, like, how people react to this because uh, um, what it sounds like, yeah, you act the dialogue. There's a little bit of of acting, right? Like, and and when you work with entrepreneurs and executives that are like, yeah, I'm not a funny person or I'm not an entertaining person, uh, uh, and like, I'm I don't feel comfortable with that. Like, what uh, does that happen? First of all. I, so I, not much, to be honest, because if you're telling people to just tell me how it happened, mm. I, the, something I, I used to say to people often is, listen, this is, this is, it's bar, not broad. See, now too much, too much, too, too much, much coffee, too much hand gesturing <laughs> and my microphone went to hell. Um, uh. So this is bar, not Broadway, right? Talk to me as if you were talking at a bar or over uh. dinner with your friends uh. and not yeah. Broadway. So would you tell it? that way to your friend yeah. or, or to someone over dinner like 
well, no, I was like, I wouldn't like, would you use this language? Because people were very easily fall into like corporate buzz buzzwords. Yeah. It's like, would you tell a friend about what happened to this project in that language? It's like, no, I would say, yeah, so we're doing this thing. It was really important. My boss was on my ass about make sure that this was a big success. But, you know, we we kind of screwed it up. Fine. You just use that language. Like, tell it that way. Now, again, it depends on who you're talking to. You might have to adjust the language slightly, yeah. but but be as natural as you can be. And naturally, people do dialogue. You say, like, you wouldn't believe what my boss just told me. I was like, what happened? So I walk into the room and he looks at me and says, Francisco, what do you think you're doing? Like, people do that naturally. It, you don't explain the story to a friend and say, I walked into the room and he looked at me and asked me what I was doing. Yeah, maybe some people do, but it's a very small tweak to just yeah. like, don't do your boss's voice. Don't do the accent. If your boss has an accent, unless you're great at accents, don't do it if you wouldn't do it naturally. But just like, just give me what he actually said. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, it's a very minor thing. But when I ask, like I tell a story that way and I tell a story just with telling and not enough showing and you ask people, what did, you know, what did you like about that story? It's like, oh, I could really see it. Like I could see it as mm -hmm. if I was there, right? And whereas the other ways, I was like, oh, it's kind of boring. It's like you're just telling me a bunch of stuff. Yeah. They don't, they don't necessarily know what to phrase, how to phrase it, but the the I could definitely see it happening, or it was very lively, it was very engaging, and sometimes they don't know why, but that's why. It's because I'm, you know, it's it's happening in real time. Yeah. And people are talking, and I'm telling you what it looked like. How did, you know, what did it look like? How did I feel? That, yeah. That's kind of essentially it. Yes. And what I'm hearing from what you're saying is, is again, letting go of the layers of what should and really going back into the observation and uh, going back to a, a bit more uh, to authenticity, right? Like being authentic and, and saying how things happen and then just wrapping it up with, with the point. When it comes to humor, like something that I find I had to wrap my head around in telling stories with humor is that I thought I had to be a comedian and like make jokes. And I found that this is not necessarily the case and that often there's, there's, you know, there's comedy and truth oftentimes also sometimes just a point of view can be, um, can be relatable and therefore humorous, but I'm curious to hear your point of view of how to find humor in, in our own stories. Yeah, jokes are a terrible idea, <laughs> um, unless you are a comedian and you do yeah. comedy. And, and I listened to some of the stuff that I used to do years ago, and I used to have the odd joke here and there. In a, It wasn't a joke, it was more like a, a committed comment on the situation. And I find that you don't, you don't need that. It makes it sound weirder if you're not in a, in a speech or presentation like if i'm speaking at a at a speaking co speaking competition that kind of works because it's that it's an entertainment thing yeah but you wouldn't do that in a business setting it just seems weird it's like why are you trying to do stand-up comedy but what does work but there's two approaches you can either have a ridiculous life which is my approach then you don't need to find humor the humor is there i keep doing ridiculous things and i just tell people about them so that's one approach the other thing is find the ridiculousness in the things you're doing or the things you're thinking about because mm -hmm. we if like i do a lot of stuff that i that ends up being kind of stupid but at the time i'm like it's probably going to be funny anyway, so I'll just do it. So I just have to tell people about it. So this is an example I, I've, I've from something that happened recently. I was, you know, so I was about to go into a a, a training session, and uh, I was I was giving the training, and so I have my kind of sort of my corporate uniform uh, that I always wear when I'm when I'm giving these trainings. So I'm I'm dressed, ready to go, and then I, I just check myself in the mirror and realize that my trousers are a little bit wrinkle, wrinkly. And I just, I don't have time to get them off and put them on the ironing board and, you know, iron them properly. So I think to myself, could I maybe just 
iron them a little bit without taking them off. So I get the iron and I turn it to not the hottest setting and I start kind of ironing sort of around the leg and then I realize that the part that's really wrinkly is just over, you know, my crotch. And I think this is probably a bad idea but I do need to iron these trousers. So I'm kind of like very softly trying to iron the, the, you know, the seam of my pants going, I'm sure this is a terrible idea. I can see how this would go very wrong, but I'm still doing it. Why have I not stopped doing it? And, you know, I might have spent five minutes doing that and luckily there was no major accident. But throughout the whole thing, I have this dialogue in my head going, this is really a bad idea. Like I could see the headlines already from this bad idea going even wrong. Um, and I, people, like you don't have to do it, what I, do what I did, but we think crazy stuff on a regular basis. Oh, yeah. So sometimes just sharing the thing you thought and then go, oh, no, never say that to anyone. Like that alone is kind of funny. Or, or the, the horror story that you played in your head about something very minor. You know, you sent an email, the email didn't get a response for two or three hours. And then you have this horror story of what's going on and what the client is thinking about you. And everybody's been there. So if you just share what you thought was problem, this is for sure, this 100% happened. The client hates me because of this one thing I put on the email that is kind of minor, right? Um, and we will find the humor in that. And that, that's, yeah. that's a very easy way to make things funny and relatable without yeah. you having to tell jokes or, or you know, have a ridiculous life as, as I do. Yeah. <laughs> How to live a ridiculous life by Francisco. Um, uh, well, I'm curious, are you living a ridiculous life because of the stories that you can tell as a result of that? Or are you just that type of person? It's not, it, it's not I think it's a chicken and egg thing, but I, for, for no you know, conscious intention of my own, I have always had no filter when I talk to people. So I'll often say absurd stuff and people are like, do you realize that socially this is like, people don't talk like this? I'm like, I don't know, seems sensible enough to me. Um, so that happens. Um, I don't know, I, I seem to find myself in situations that I think are kind of embarrassing, but also funny. And because I'm sharing them from the point of view of like, this is pretty funny, right? You know, I did this thing that a lot of people would never talk to anyone about because it's kind of embarrassing and I'm like, but it's kind of funny, like when you're a little removed from it. So I'll share it. So I'll pick whatever the most embarrassing thing I can think of. You know, like, for example, I don't know, guys after a certain age have to go to certain types of doctors and do certain types of exams that are very uncomfortable. Now, most people would be very quiet about it, but like, it's kind of funny. If you yeah. tell, but talk to people, it's like, like, the whole thing is funny and awkward. And if you tell people, they're like, that's actually pretty funny. It's awful. Like, I hope it never happens to me. It's like, it's happening to you. Yeah, well... Maybe it is going to happen to you. Everybody's but, doing it, yeah. And you can, there's so many things that are like that. Um, yeah. You just have to, to think, okay, what, does, what embarrasses me? Mm. Would anyone find this funny? And the answer is almost always yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. It reminds me of a Seinfeld type of humor, right? Which is very observational humor, uh, yeah. which is really looking at something like, uh you know do you know that tomato is a fruit and then just go like just looking at things of life that we often think also are normal but then we yes. uh that uh when we look at it it's kind of like this exam is very uncomfortable but we we have to do it anyway um that and, is and, 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 yeah. that, and that that might be an extreme example but here's a better doctor example which is you go to the doctor and, and the doctor asks you for to do something and you want to do well you know, like the doctor is like, let's, you know, can you please hold, hold your breath for, for just for a moment? And you go, how long can I hold it? How yeah. Expecting me to hold it. Is, is 30 seconds enough? Is it like, is it, am I going to like, can I hold my breath for longer than anyone has ever held their breath in this doctor's office? Right. So this stuff, stuff like has gone through my mind before. And I know a lot of friends are like, yeah, I kind of think the same thing is like, can, can it, maybe it will turn out that I'm some sort of freak of nature and no one has this pulmonary capacity or be some sort of superhero. And you kind of, you get like 20 seconds and you're like, 
that was really hard. <laughs> and you hope in the doctor doesn't say you have a problem. Like a grown a grown person should be able to hold their breath for a lot longer. <laughs> or, yeah, or you have a problem. I asked you for to hold your breath for five seconds. Like yes. you know. Yes, that is the other. Here, yeah, here's yeah. here's the number to another doctor you can go and yes. see. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. See that uh, didn't even occur to me. <laughs> <laughs> different perspectives. Different perspectives. Um. Uh, Life is funny. Like I just, I just love, I just love to 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 find that because also when we when we find the ridiculousness, we also take a step back and we take our life so seriously. Uh, a lot, maybe maybe not you, okay, uh, but a lot of people uh, are taking life so seriously and taking a step back and and uh, seeing the funny and just observing uh, can be uh, well very joyful. Uh, uh, I would say that. Talking about joyful, I want to play a game with you that uh, I now understand that it's going to be awfully easy for you and uh, I'm going to ridicule myself. But you know what? I'm game and this is, uh, we're going to improvise some stories. This is uh, improv a story. All right. Storytelling 101 by you. What would be a short story, uh, maybe a story spine or a few elements that we would need to have in a, a, like a 60 to 90 second story? So the, one of the simplest ones that I've that I've often taught people, I know this is not going to be the one you're thinking of, but the one I often tell people is is a very simple one, which is um, before, but so and after. Okay. So you know, give people a tiny bit of understanding of what's going on, what's the context, introduce a problem. So but yeah. mm -hmm. um, then you know, what are the actions? What are the things you've done because of that problem? And after, you know, how was life after that happened? Because stories should be about change in some way. Okay. So, so that's before, but so and after is a pretty basic story spine. All right. Well, then let's use that. Uh, I'm going to give you a keyword and I have a timer um, and uh, you have 90 seconds top to tell a story inspired that by that keyword. Your first keyword, I may or may not have done my research around that, but your first keyword is werewolf. <laughs> All right, so one of the... <laughs> I was talking to someone, I was talking to someone two weeks ago, and she, she does a lot of work with charity organizations, and she has lots of weird habits. And one of the ones she talks about is a very weird habit is how she reads a lot. And she says she reads 50 books, 50 books per year. And I said to her, well, you know, that's, that's very impressive. But but I read about about 80 to 100 books a year and she was super impressed with with my accomplishments as a reader and i said well i mean one thing that is probably worth me mentioning when i say that i read 80 to 100 books a year is that i read all sorts of books i actually have categories of books that i kind of cycle around you know it's fiction there's non-fiction there is you know self-development or whatever in one of those categories might or might not be werewolves and she's like well, what do you mean werewolves it's like I, every six or seven books i read a book that is about werewolves and if i can't find a book about werewolves then about wolves which is not quite the same but but you know there's the success there's so many werewolf books out there i was like not enough i <laughs> wish there were more <laughs> why I, I i'm not sure we have time to go into that <laughs> Well, maybe a business idea here uh, for you. That is, that is awesome. Um, I'm very curious about, is it like fiction, mostly fiction werewolf stories or like real life? I'm kidding. What do you mean, what do you mean mostly fiction? What is the non-fiction werewolf story? <laughs> Documentation, I mean, there, there uh, are, like legends, who knows? There are, no, there are, there are non-fiction wolf books. Uh, which some are very good, but it's like nature type of books. But I find them not as pleasing as the werewolf books. Uh, and you'd be surprised about the types of werewolf books that are out there. One of the best ones is about a werewolf spy fighting Hitler. <laughs> oh, wow. That's very imaginative. Awesome. Yes. All yes. right. Wow. Okay. Um, so much to go into. Uh, second word for you, skirt. <laughs> uh, so I was 18 
and uh, I mean Carnival in Brazil. So mm. Carnival is this big week-long party um, in Brazil. I'm, I'm on the beach with my friends, and uh, and I'm dressed like a woman because we had this this very politically incorrect thing back home in, in Carnival, which is called uh, uh, foot gay. So it was a combination of people cross-dressing and playing football. So if you cross-dressed, you'd get drinks for free all afternoon for basically no money. So I'm wearing I'm wearing a mini skirt and a crochet top. Um, let your imagination run wild with that one. And I'm having a great time with my friends until until I hear Francisco. And I turned around and it's this girl that I had hooked up with the night before. Uh, at a party and I had said to her just come over to this beach where we're gonna be it's gonna be fun you know I'll love to see you again but I forgot to tell her that I'll be dressed like a woman so <laughs> second time I ever saw this girl she sees me wearing a miniskirt and a crochet top and makeup um, so yeah it um, it was it was an interesting second date but... yeah. yeah 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 was there a third date <laughs> surprisingly yes <laughs> But you well, know, I do, I, I do have lovely legs. I, I can only ascribe it to that. Yeah, well, <laughs> take your word for it. We'll take your word for it. Um, uh, awesome. Well, what would be uh, that? That's hilarious. It, that reminds me a lot of of the carnival here. Uh, also, um, okay. Uh, hold on. Let me take my timer. Last keyword. For me or for be, you? Yeah, for you. Uh, for me, sorry. Parrot. Parrot. Um, oh, I'm a blank. Uh, parrot, parrot. I'm thinking that makes me think of a pirate. Um, and uh, a pirate story uh, that I may have. That makes me think of, um, of, of, of the carnival here. Uh, so uh, I live in Tenerife and it's the second, okay, I know it's not, it's not as big as anything happening in Brazil, but we have a carnival here. Um, and uh, where also people tend to dress at, as, uh, you know, another gender. Uh, uh, um, and um, something that uh, I find interesting is that um, uh, couples like to do couple um, um, costumes where uh, an example of that would be if the lady is dressed as Tinkerbell, then the, the man will also be, you know, the boyfriend will also be dressed as Tinkerbell and all of his football team. Uh, and uh, there will be a lot of tights and high heels uh, uh, at the carnival. Uh, and um, and uh, once uh, uh, my husband and I, uh, well, we were looking for a couple, um, a, a couple of costume and uh, he wanted to dress as you know a woman uh so he said why wouldn't you be well when i be a stripper and you could be a trucker end of the 90 seconds uh and um i said yes and there was the most comfortable carnival i've ever been because i was in sweatpants all <laughs> all the uh, all night partying all night in sweatpants with a fake mustache um all right so well that's <laughs> That's the beauty of improvising a story. Actually, you know what? That was a lie. I want I want to hear you one more. Sure, uh, um, Lamp. Lamp. Jeez. Um, okay, so <clears throat> so I've got two. I've got two young daughters. One of them, the oldest is now five. The youngest is is two, and uh, and they've always lapped in the dark. Like they, we never, you know, we never thought it was the best of ideas to to have like one of those little lamps in the in the room, like a little child lamp. Um, so so they had some light, um, and there was never really much of a problem until I thought that it was a great idea to share my love, my strange love for wolves with my daughter when she was, I think, three and a half years old. And, and I thought it was great. And I talked about it and I showed her some pictures and I might have even showed her a video. And and we, we, we read, um, you know, the Three Little Pigs and all of that. And lo and behold, that night she woke up uh, after having a terrible nightmare 
because a wolf was coming into her room and she needed light so the wolf wouldn't come in. And uh, I, I tried to convince her otherwise because I didn't want to set the precedent. Didn't work terribly well. Um, and I eventually managed to convince her that no wolves could get into our house because wolves don't know how to operate a lift. And uh, although somehow they would be able to open our door, according to her, the lift would baffle the wolves because in the forest there are no lifts. And um, that worked until we went to spend some holidays on a house that had no lift. And then the wolf nightmares <laughs> were back. So, yes, the lamp sometimes makes an appearance in yeah. the children's bedroom. <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. That's a, that's, a, that's a great story. That's a great justification for why the wolf wouldn't be able to reach you. It's like there are wolves, but they can't operate lifts. So rest assured. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, all right. All right. Um, Francisco, where can we find more of your awesomeness and hear more of those wonderful stories? Well, I think I'm still looking for my awesomeness, but if you want... Oh, we see of, it. Don't worry. If you want more of me, the, the, the best place to look me up is LinkedIn. I'm yeah. very present there with regular videos and, and, and stories every week. Um, you can look me up online at storypowers.com and that way you don't have to learn how to spell my, my surname. Uh, and I, as you mentioned, I have the podcast, the Story Powers podcast, which yeah. is now coming up to 97 episodes, Ooh. which is me talking to a whole bunch of people about stories and usually my guests will bring the, will bring the wisdom and I will bring the the, with the nonsense and the tang tangential stories that might or might not add value to the conversation. Well, we'll be the judge of that. Uh, and you also have, uh, you also do great coaching. You have an online course, am I correct? Or, well, well yeah, an so, online like when, and you, you're the chef. Yeah, so, that comes yeah, so the, the, the way I normally explain it to people is if, imagine you wanted to learn how to cook, um, but instead of just buying a cookbook, the, the chef came along with you. So I yeah. have this thing where I do with people that's called the Story Powers Bootcamp, where they have an online, a whole bunch of online stuff that they get to do at their own time. But then, you know, I interact with them. We talk story together. We have live sessions and I help them figure out what they need to get better at when it comes to using stories to, to attract their ideal clients and grow their business. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Well some stuff some stuff to look up thank you so much for being with me to for coming in to tell some stories and laughing on the mean green ukulele podcast stories and laughing are what i'm what i'm here for yay always. thank you so much for watching or listening to the mean green ukulele podcast you can follow and reach out to our guests at the links available in the description of this podcast if you enjoyed our joyful conversation today, please consider subscribing or leaving a review. I would love to hear from you. You can find me on LinkedIn and you can come and say hello. Or if you want to hang out, I host regular free masterclasses where we play our way to less stress and more joy. So you can find all the information on my LinkedIn profile. I hope to see you soon. Ciao.